Okay. Well, while it's uh, twirling, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll go to full red here in a minute. But uh, we are in segment two, uh, and we're still in the year 2022. Jack, you dying there? Oh, sorry. It's all right. Well, we've made it to May. Warm weather is here. Break out the golf clubs. Uh, segment two, Moses from Pharaoh's Palace, the Midian. And I subtitled this, what are you doing for the next 40 years? So uh, this was, uh, I enlarged this segment because this used to be from Pharaoh's Palace, the Midian and back again, but we're not going to get them back again until next week. Okay. So we're just only going to cover 40 years of his life here. Um, one of the major figures of the Exodus, and in reality, of the whole Old Testament, is Moses. So let's consider how God worked in his life so as to become the standard in which all prophets were to be judged. Even Jesus Christ was likened unto him. Hebrews 3, verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 5, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony or for a witness of those things which were to be spoken after. You know, it's a good thing to be faithful in your own house, but to willingly choose to be a faithful servant in the master's house, in God's house, is extremely high praise. Being faithful means that you believe what God has to say and you do what he wants accurately, consistently, to the best of your ability. You know, you don't change the orders. Those in the military understand that. Oh, I don't like what that guy said. I'm doing it my way. You don't do that with God. You want to be faithful. So um, being faithful, it's someone who trusts God daily and endeavors to carry out his will reliably. Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto me. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy 18, Moses did bear witness to those things which were to be spoken later by the prophet whom God would send. And this is a prophecy pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ. The standard of excellence that Jesus Christ was compared against regarding the ministry of a prophet as a spokesman for God was that of Moses. We talk about high praise. This illustrates for us again the caliber of Moses' faithfulness, his willingness to listen to God, to carry out his will consistently, and to speak on God's behalf. Deuteronomy 34, 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In Hebrews 3, 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Moses is considered faithful in all of his house compared to how a servant is to be to his master. Now, the Greek noun for servant here is th uh, therapon. This is its only use in the New Testament. It is used describing someone who is a ministering servant, a servant of servants, the humblest servant, an attendant or caretaker. Its verb form meant to cherish or care for, especially for those who are sick. Our English word therapeutics comes from it. In Exodus 14:31, we read, And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord, and they believed his servant. The Septuagint, it's thereupon, Moses. It's only used in the New Testament. We go to the Old Testament, um, the Greek translation, the Septuagint, and we find a few other records of how it's used. So here, Moses, again, is called, in Exodus 14, he is called a servant. Moses was successful as an obedient servant to his Lord, and people noticed his example. Numbers 12, 5 through 8. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud, and he stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. 
And they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. This is God singling the two of them out. I mean, all right, hear my words, you two. If there be a prophet among you, because they both uh, were, uh, were not happy with Moses. And hey, God talks to us too. And God, and God just went, yeah, you guys can't even hold Moses's uh, sandal. So he's, he's calling them out on it. Hear now my words. If thou be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. And dreams with prophetic meaning is what it means, but that's the starting point of prophecy. Back in the Old Testament, that's where, you know, God would relay certain information, but that's the lowest form of him being able to give revelation. So he's just saying, look, you guys get it in a dream, but my servant, my therapon, Moses, is not so, who was faithful in all my house. With him, I will speak mouth to mouth even apparently or clearly or openly. And I won't speak to him in dark riddles, or dark speeches. You know, I'm not just, hey, here's a riddle for you today. Try and figure it out. No, he speaks clearly. He speaks openly. He speaks mouth to mouth. It's a great figure of speech. And the similitude of the form and glory of the Lord shall he see, shall he behold. You know, wherefore then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant there upon Moses? God spoke Mouth to mouth with Moses, clearly, openly, plainly, and not in riddles or parables, but through an interpreter. Moses was allowed to behold the form, the image, the likeness of the Lord. He has actually seen the glory of God. Since God is spirit and thus invisible, Moses does not actually see God's face. I mean, God didn't have a giant face up here to him. But God showed him some unmistakable evidence of his glorious presence. God describes Job like Moses as a servant with sparkling credentials before and after his being tempted by Satan to curse God. Job 2, 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. You know, Moses and God talked. They openly communicated with one another. Moses trusted God. They had intimate, friendly fellowship. Exodus 33, 33, 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. I think today that, that, would, that it would read, and the man speaks to, the Lord speaks to Moses text to text, right? Psalm 103, 7, Bob. He made known his ways or his purposes and reasons unto Moses his acts or deeds unto the children of Israel. How was Moses able to get to know God this well? <laughs> he did the old-fashioned way. He earned it. Many times he had to intercede for Israel. Read Psalm 106 to get a good, concise overview of what he had to go through in order to accomplish what he did on behalf of God's people. You know, during Moses' lifetime, he had many altercations with individuals who thought they could do his God-given responsibility better. I thought I was very judicious by wording it this way. He had many altercations <laughs> with individuals who thought they could just do the, you know, do his God-given responsibility better. Psalm 106, 16. They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Sure, Moses had fears, inadequacies, and shortcomings. He was human but he developed a relationship and a willingness to do the will of the Lord, to carry out God's intense desires. A verse in the book of Numbers offers additional insight into this great man. Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek, or humble, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. See, Moses built a relationship with God over time. It didn't happen automatically or by osmosis. Too many times people dwell on the ingreatness of a man, forgetting that it took a lifetime to deliver the results he obtained. They do not respect his life and accomplishments while he was living. You know, as we continue, we will see how Moses earned the reputation God gives him. Exodus 2.1. And there was a man, his name was Amram, of the house of Levi. And he took the wife, a daughter of Levi, and her name is Jochebed. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, 
he was pleasant, favorable, beautiful to guide. She hid him for three months because they were supposed to kill all the children. See, Levi was five, all the male children. Levi was five years older than his brother Joseph. And he lived to be 137. Levi then outlived Joseph by 22 years. He had only died 37 years previously to his great grandson Moses being born. Moses was the seventh from Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses. The study of genealogy helps with the dating of how long the children of Israel were, bonded, were uh, in bondage in Egypt. Remember last week, the 430 years, the 400 years? Well, there's only seven of them. Some of these guys had to live a heck of a lot longer uh, than what the Bible tells us uh, to get 400 years or 430 years. So it was all pointed out it was only 200 some years. Verse three from the New International Version, but when she could, when she could no, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. You know, I don't just thought they kind of floated it across. No, they they stashed him there. Now papyrus is a thick, strong, tough, reedy plant, which grew plentiful on the banks of the Nile. And it was used by the Egyptians for cords, ropes, baskets, boats, sails, writing material, and a myriad of other purposes, even food at times. The tar slime or bitumen was coated on the plated papyrus, and when hardened, this mineral tar became firm and waterproof. God gave similar instruction to Noah for the waterproofing of the ark, for the survival of mankind. So that little boat wasn't going to sink. And right, here is some papyrus right, right here. It's a reedy plant. You know, here's it all put together. Uh, look, there's somebody who painted something on it. But you can see uh, the reeds, the way it's put together and all strung together. Of course, this was done by a machine, not by person. You know, the real expensive stuff, though, you know, is better. You know, here's, here's a, here's, I, I got these in Cairo, so they're genuine. I, this was this one was genuine. It cost me two two American dollars. It even had a thing that said it was genuine in eighteen different languages. Meanwhile, I paid quite a bit more for this because it really is. But you can see again the papyrus and what it's like. Okay. All right, Hebrews eleven gives us more insight as to why Moses' parents would do this. Hebrews eleven twenty three, the first part of the verse says, "By faith." By believing, by faith or by believing Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents. All right. Moses' parents hid him for three months by believing the revelation that they had received from God. They told no one. Brother Aaron, who was three years older than Moses, must have been born before the mandatory death sentence for all male children. Aaron and his sister Miriam knew how to keep their mouth shut about their little baby brother. They'd take pictures of them on her phone and show them to everybody. When it became too dangerous, Moses' parents put him in a basket that appeared to have drifted by the current and landed in the reedy thicket along the Nile River. Remember, they said they put it in that, they put it in a specific spot. We'll see here. Since there is nowhere in God's word that directs one to do this, if the government threatens to kill children, where did the information come from? God. It was because of the divine revelation that they believed, making it the manifestation of believing, that Amran and Jochebed built a little basket boat and set Moses afloat in it. It was then strategically placed where Pharaoh's daughter could find it. Hebrews 11, 23, by faith, by believing, now we just read the first part of this, by believing Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper osteos child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They weren't afraid of the king's edict. The only other place the Greek word astios is used is during Stephen's sermon, recorded in the book of Acts in Acts 7. And he also is referring to Moses' birth, Acts 7.20. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair, Rastrios, and nourished up in his father's house three months. A note by Reverend Walter Cummins on a journey through Acts and the Epistles on page 45 states, the Greek words rendered exceeding are to Theo, which means to God. 
The Greek word rendered fair is astios, which literally means of the city. It may also be rendered elegant, urbane, noble, pleasant, well-pleasing, comely, beautiful, fair, or of polished manners. Here, read the Bible, read us the English Standard Version of Acts 7.20. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. In Exodus 2.2. And the, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Okay, now the note uh, by Reverend Cummins in the journey through Acts and the Epistles continues because he's not going to talk about the word godly. And he calls it tob, and it means good, pleasant, agreeable, or favorable. Now, at three months old, Moses would not have exhibited goodness or polished manners. Thus, it is to be understood that what mother's that what mothers, let me say that again. It is to be understood that what Moses' mother saw was from God, that Moses was to be such a person as described by both the Hebrew word in Exodus 2, 2 and the Greek word in Acts 7, 20 and Hebrews 11, 23. Stephen thus describes Moses as elegant to God, noble to God, or beautiful to God. What Moses' mother understood from God was that her child was no ordinary child but one who was to be an elegant, noble, fair, beautiful to God individual. You know, beauty was regarded by the ancients as the mark of divine favor. All right, let's continue. Exodus 2, 4, and 5. And his sister stood afar off to wit or to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh, Josephus names her Thermoth Thermuthius, came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along the river's side and when she saw the ark among the flags or the reeds, she sent her maid to fetch it. Now, bathing in the Nile, since it was a sacred river, was permissible in Egypt, even by royalty. She could have been bathing because a religious feast was about to happen. Uh, the areas of the Nile around sacred temples were usually fenced off as a protection from the crocodiles. And the princess probably had an enclosed space reserved for her own private use. The location which she utilized would have been cordoned off, but it would have been known to others, you know, with signs saying, stay away. You know, so all of that helped us to understand where, why they could place the, the uh, basket in a certain area and have his sister nearby. Because she was coming to a specific place that was basically hers and just happened that this uh, basket floated by and stuck, got caught right by where she's at. Verse 6. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and the little baby was weeping. And she had compassion on him and said, oh, it's one of the Hebrews' children. Isn't he the cutest thing? Now, I had to add that, but you know that's what she said. You know, Isn't this the cutest thing? And he's redder than a beach. Right? Okay. If you were trying to keep a baby alive, who would be better to find him than Pharaoh's daughter? That's going to cut through all the red tape in a hurry. What luck! By chance, it just happened to be Pharaoh's daughter. Then Miriam, Moses' oldest sibling, who later in Exodus 15, 20, is called a prophetess, splendidly performs her role in this godly scheme. You can see how all of these, all aspects of this, God just laid it out for them what they needed to do. Verse 7. And then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Quite a change of events. A short time before, the whole family was in peril, for having gone against Pharaoh's edict by keeping their son alive. Now she was to be paid for keeping and nursing that very same son. What a God. He was probably nursing the knowledge and ways of God too. One would think that since Moses' parents had the spirit of God upon them, it must have had some lasting effect on how his formative years were spent, especially his education pertaining to Jehovah, the covenant God. Verse 10. And the child grew. And she, brought unto, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. 
There are three languages that have to be considered for the name Moses, Egyptian, Hebrew, and Greek. Moses' parents had given him a Hebrew name. They didn't just call him baby three or something. You know, he had to have some kind of name early on. All right. Mo in Egyptian is river and Usus means saved out of it or to draw out. That's where Moses, but Moshi is another way of pronouncing it. Or you can do it Moshi without the H, you know, which means son of water or was drawn out of water. But since everybody knows him as Moses, that's his most traditional name. We'll stick with Moses. When Jerusalem was ransacked and burned in 70 AD, the scrolls that were in the temple were given to an ex-Jewish general turned Roman ally named Flavorus Josephus. But Josephus then wrote two books, The Antiquities of the Jews and The War of the Jews, utilizing the Bible text he had. And he was doing this in Rome. He had a nice Roman villa that, you know, he was able to get, he was given all this and he was able to write these books. Now, the first and only full edition of Josephus's works uh, in English was written by William Whitston. I'm going to show you this book here. It says Josephus, okay? And it's in English, which is good, because this guy, William Whitson, translated it, and it became available in 1737 for the first time. There has been many revisions made over the years, but he's the only one who's done a complete, a complete translation of the history of the Jews and the war of the Jews, okay? Whitson was a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton. And he helped to popularize, popularize Newton's theories. In fact, he, he, uh, when Newton left Cambridge, he took over uh, his, his department. But Winston was like Newton. They were both convinced Arians. Do you know what that means, being a convinced Arian? It means they didn't believe in the Trinity, both Newton and Winston. And he set forth his views in an essay. And that led to his loss of profession at Cambridge in 1710. So he's lost his job over his discourse on this subject. But him and Sir Isaac Newton, who was probably the greatest uh, scholar of, you know, uh, of the first thousand years of just scholarly input. He, Newton's only, Newton, Newton was so smart that he invented calculus to teach the law of physics. All right. When reading secular authors like Josephus or Philo or Eusebius, one must remember that what they had written about certain events are from a historical perspective, which may be slanted, but not from a divinely inspired viewpoint. The Bible was inspired. God gave them the words. They wrote it down. Historians, you know, it's what they see, what they've heard. It's slanted to what they believe. It's all put together from their viewpoint. Now, Josephus rel relates to us in the Antiquities of the Jews his information about Moses on page 57. Now, Moses' understanding became superior to his age. Nay, far beyond that standard, and when he was taught, he discovered greater quickness of apprehension than was usual at his age. And his actions at that time promised greater when he should come to the age of a man. God did also give him that tallness when he was but three years old, as was wonderful. And as for his beauty, there was nobody so unpolite as when they saw Moses, they were not greatly surprised at the beauty of his countenance. Nay, it happened frequently that those that met him as he was carried along the road were obliged to turn again upon seeing the child, that they left what they were about and stood still a great while to look on him. For the beauty of the child was so remarkable and natural to him on many accounts that it detained the spectators and made them stay longer to look upon him. So he's backing up what we just read, what God said about him. Now, he also continues on, though, about what his mother did. So, uh, <coughs> Therm 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 yeah, yeah, her too. Thermutus, therefore, perceiving him to be so remarkable a child, adopted him for his son, having no child of her own. And when one time had carried Moses to her father, she showed him to him, and she and she said she thought to make him her father's successor. If it should please God, she should have no legitimate child of her own. And to him, I have brought up a child who is of a divine form and of a generous mind, and as I have received him from the bounty of the river in a wonderful manner. I thought proper to adopt him, my son, and the heir of the kingdom. 
And she had, after she had said this, she put the infant in her father's hands. So he took him and hugged him to his breast. And on his daughter's account, in a pleasant way, put his diadem, put the crown upon his head. But Moses threw it down to the ground. In a perial mood, he wreathed it round and trotted upon it with his feet, which seemed to bring along with it an evil presage concerning the kingdom of evil. So when you read some of this stuff, it, it's just background information to help enhance some of the things, but a lot of it is based upon the scriptures. But he get, you know, he like I said, adds his input. There are also details given by Josephus recorded later in his works that explain Moses' as top general of Pharaoh's army, leading an Egyptian army south to subdue the Ethiopians. The historian Arrhenius gives a good, concise overview of the conquest. Iranius quotes Josephus and says, Josephus says that when Moses was nourished in the king's palace, he was appointed general of the army against the Ethiopians and conquered them when he married that king's daughter, because out of her affection for him, she delivered the city up to him. And that's, of course, from the fragments of Iranius, which you probably have lying around. Okay. Anyway, there's a whole lot more information. He, feel, he talks about how Moses uh, was able to move so quickly and uh, really... Uh, had some interesting ways in which to to uh, win the war against the Ethiopians. So with that, we go back to Acts 7 and read verses 20 to 22. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nursed up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned or instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty or powerful in words and in deeds. Moses was mighty in words and in deeds. One of his mighty deeds, according to Josephus, was as a general, the head of an army. He would have been trained in military tactics, such as how to mobilize large numbers of troops and the necessary means needed for them to travel great distances in a relatively short time. Do you think that expertise might come in handy? later in life question moses received quite an education in the palace of pharaoh both in mind and body in leadership and in physical training he had money power and the prestige that the great egyptian court had later he would shun all of it because he believed he had a mission from god to accomplish exodus 2 11 and 12. and it came to pass in those days when moses was grown 40 years old that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian, a taskmaster, smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. One of the taskmasters who would have been trained in self-defense was cruelly treating Moses' fellow Hebrew without a just cause. We'll see that in a minute when we read Acts 7.24. To, you know, he was he was treating without just he was uh, cruelly treating him without a just cause to the point of near death. Moses had been a skilled general in the Egyptian army, so he must have been a pretty rugged soldier himself to be able to take out this taskmaster. According to existing customs among nomadic tribes, he was bound to avenge the blood of a brother. But since this Egyptian was a government official, he was under the laws of Egypt. So he tries to conceal what he has done. Verses 13 and 14 now. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Moses thought they knew who he was, that he would be their deliverer. Here's the Acts 7, 24 and 25. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Exodus, Exodus 21, 5, the first part of this verse, Bob. <laughs> Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. Pharaoh had been looking for an excuse to dispose of Moses for some time. Now he had one. 
Hebrews 11, 24 to 27, from the working translation we read, by believing Moses, having become great, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to have a temporary enjoyment of sin. He considered the insults suffered for the coming Christ to be greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he looked to the reward. To the reward. By believing he left Egypt, not fearing the rage of the king, in fact, he persevered as though he saw him who was invisible. Moses forsook Egypt. He saw something much greater than earthly power and riches. He understood the greater riches which the coming Savior would bring, a permanent deliverance. Okay, Bob, why don't you finish Exodus 2.15 now? But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Moses left Egypt, you know, in a hurry. He wouldn't stay in the Sinai Peninsula, which was under Egyptian rule. He fled across it past the right finger of the Red Sea into the land of Midian, which currently is known as Saudi Arabia. It's referred to as Arabia in the Bible. So here's a map. <laughs> you'll be getting this map. I think you'll get it next week. But the point is, is that this is the way the route of the children of Israel. But Moses, when he came down here, he didn't go south. He came this way, and then he went around Etham in the Midian. Of course, he you know didn't cross the water. He didn't cross water at the time. So this will be a map that you'll get um, once I figure something out. Uh, anyway, so he came through the Sinai Peninsula and around in the Midian. Midian's on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba. All right. This event marks the second of three phases of Moses' life on earth. Not much is written about the next 40 years, but he does get firsthand knowledge of how to exist in that harsh desert area. His believing parents' upbringing, his schooling in the courts of Egypt, his military background, learning how to move large amounts of people and supplies quickly, along with this desert lifestyle, gave him the best education needed for what he'd be called upon later in life to fulfill. Some things in life come with patience and age. There is a certain knowledge that is gained with experience over time. Life always balances out when God is right at the center of a man's life. Verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Now the shepherds didn't show the priest's daughters much respect, even though as a priest he had gained the trust of the people. There was little water in the land of Midian. Shepherds would seize on the wells before others came, lest their flocks should want water and it run out before they could get enough. When the thirsty animals see the watering troughs, they're trained. This, you know, oh, that's where I get my water. They could stampede those, especially during droughts. As some beasts are drinking, the others that are waiting, they're, they're just howling. You know, you know, I don't know what kind of sound a camel makes, but they're just out there howling, waiting to get over to the, you know, to the animals. When one flock is through, another comes in. There can be much fighting over the watering, and the powerful and well-armed are feared by the unarmed and the female shepherds. When these shepherds saw Moses, they knew that he was a nobleman. His apparel, his shaven face, and his hands showed that he was not an ordinary man. So, verse 18. So he helped them uh, water their flock. And nobody really messed with them. He just stepped in and watered their flock. All right, verse 18. And when they came to rule their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? Yeah, they're used to being pushed to the back. Real in Hebrew means friend of God. Now Jethro is another name for this man. And according to Lambs, that was a priestly title like his excellence or reverence, a reverend. Verse 19. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. It says in Egyptian. This is clear then that the land of Midian was not in Egypt, not even in the Sinai Peninsula. One would not be surprised to find an Egyptian in Egypt, would they? Hmm. However, in Midian, one would. 
The daughters of Real, Real referred to Moses as an Egyptian, as someone from another country. Now, Midian was a descendant of Abraham by Keturah. The Midianites spoke a Hebrew dialect, which would be easy for Moses to understand. They, like other descendants of Abraham and Lot, knew about the Lord God of their ancestors. Now, verse 20. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah, Little Bird, his daughter. Oh, pick Little Bird. He probably didn't give his daughter to Moses for some time, because 40 years later, when Moses is ready to travel with his family back to Egypt, they're riding an animal and indicating that his children were still young, young at that time. Verse 22. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, a sojourner there, a resident alien. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. According to common practice, they would name their children after commemorative incidents in the family's history. His next son is named Eleazar, which means God is my help. So for the next 40 years of his life, he's content to stay with uh, Reuel, or Ragul is another way uh, spelled, marry his daughter, have two sons, and be the guardian and superintendent over his cattle. Meanwhile, the bondage and cruelty of the Egyptians against the children of Israel continued throughout these 40 years. First part of verse 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Since Moses was considered Pharaoh's daughter's only son, he would be next in line to be Pharaoh. Thus, he would have become Pharaoh over all of Egypt at this time. Instead, verse 23, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Uh, and basically, this is put in, in put in as if it got worse under the next Pharaoh. And God heard their groan, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And you know, and here, here's their real names: Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we were looking at their names, you know, how we came up with Moses. Well, here's here's those three guys' names. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. God was concerned about his people. He cared about them. God showed compassion, and he had a plan to rescue them out from the cruel hand of the Egyptians. We go to chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, wilderness, and desert are the same Hebrew word. And came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw, that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now, Stephen in Acts 7 calls what Moses is experiencing a vision from God. Acts 7, 31. When Moses saw it, he wondered, he marveled at this sight. The word, the Greek word for sight here is uh Horama, which is uh, translated vision, every place it's translated in the New Testament, except here, it's called sight. So when Moses saw what was going on, he marveled at the vision. And as he drew near to examine it, a voice of the Lord came unto him. Moses now has a discussion with God while he's in the vision, just like Saul of Tarsus did in Acts 9, right? Saul's talking to Jesus back and forth. How about the Mount of Transfiguration? You got Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter, of course, he speaks in the middle of the vision too. So this is not that unusual. This was a vision, according to Stephen. I guess Stephen kind of knew what he was talking about. And it makes much more sense on this whole clearness of the burning bush and everything. Exodus 3, 5. And he said, draw nigh, draw not nigh hither. 
Put off thy shoes, your sandals, from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. To remove one's sandals in a house or holy place is the highest token of respect to the host and the God. Metaphorically, shoes are symbolic of contempt and false belief and disregard for responsibility. Uh, there was a certain president that was in a certain company, country here uh, over the last oh, 25 years or so, and one of the people in the audience took a shoe off and threw it at him. Uh, and that person uh, paid dearly for that act, but he was showing contempt. They took him out back and beat the crap out of him is what they did. Uh, ver uh, verse 6, moreover, now God is going to introduce himself. I am the God of thy father, who is his father, Amram. Amram, Moses' father, had listened to God and saved Moses' life when he was an infant. Moses' parents, operating manifestations, their training of young Moses and their teaching Moses to believe and reverence God, had helped set the stage for what Moses is about to be called to do. Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Here, again, I am the God of thy father, singular. Other times God uses this, but he says, I am the God of thy fathers. And then he has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, plural. This was singular. There would have been no reason for God to reintroduce himself that here if Moses had the Spirit of God upon him and had already been receiving a revelation. That's why God showed him a vision. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and I'm going to bring them up out of that land unto a good land. And you can see Moses as he's going through it. All of a sudden, it's a flashback to him, you know, in his mind. He knew what the taskmasters were doing. He was involved with all of that. So God's saying, I'm going to take you to a land. I'm going to get you out of Egypt. A good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Basically, it means a land flowing with goat's milk and date syrup. But it doesn't quite have, you know, it's quite a good, nice uh, you know, rhyme and reason to it. It's milk and honey, you know, like pizza and beer, or, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, unto the place, I'm going to take you to the place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites are all living. And I'm going to give you that land. Now, God makes two promises to Moses. The first was that he was going to deliver his people from the hand of the Egyptians. The second was that he would successfully get them into the land of promise, a good and large land that was flowing with milk and honey. The land must have been a great and faithful land since six nations were living in it. It might have been a not so great place for a clan of 70 to increase to a mighty nation in a relatively short time. The land of Goshen in Egypt was much more conducive for growth. Now, what we've been reading in 6 through 8, we start seeing God say, I am, I have, I know, I am. God is now involved. Verses 9 and 10. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I will send you on my behalf. Today we minister in Christ's stead. He didn't deliver them sooner because God had to have a man with spirit upon him and the ability to not only lead, but one who the people were capable of following. It will take plenty of courage to keep these people in line, as we will find out. Verse 11. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is bringing up his, human, his humanness. Who am I to represent you? I'm not worthy. You know, it's okay to have doubt. It is how you deal with the doubt, right? To defeat the doubt that really counts. Verse 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token or a sign unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moffat translates it as, they shall worship God on this very hill. Now, 
Where is this very hill? He's not in the Sinai Peninsula. He's in Midian. He's in Saudi Arabia, which means the Mount of Moses, Mount Horeb, is also then, we will find out later, in Arabia or Saudi Arabia. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's not at St. Catherine's Monastery. But we'll get to that at another time. The first assurance that God gives Moses is the comfort of knowing that he truly would be with them. You are doing this because I want it done. I will be with you. And then a token is established by God with Moses that he re would return to this very mountain with the children of Israel to serve there, to serve God there. Verse 13, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they're going to ask me, well, what's his name? Or really, it's what's behind his name? How powerful is he? You know, what's behind this name? What shall I say unto them? So Moses' heart softened. He's talking things over with God. And God said unto Moses in verse 14, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt, thou, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, have sent me unto you. All right, the capital letters mean nothing from the text except the translator's private interpretation of what they think is important. They thought it was really cool to capitalize on it, make it really, I am that I am. Well, literally, it's very simple in Hebrew. It means I will be what I will be, or I will become what I need to become. There was no, <coughs> excuse me, there was no pronounceable name for the true God. In contrast to the pagans who always called their name gods by name, he could have showed up and said, you know, hey, you know, it's Baal or, you know, whatever. They all had names. Dr. Lamza in his Aramaic translation of the Bible refers to how God described himself here as, you can call me the living God, or that which I always have been. Moses was reared in Egypt, who had many gods as did the Midianites. He wanted to be sure of the deity with whom he was communing. So Moses had heard about the God of his ancestors from his mother from the Israelites in Egypt. He had been told that the Hebrew God was the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Verses 15 to 17 now. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of, the, of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Pezzesites, and the Hivites, and the Jezebites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. You see that the Lord God of your fathers, not where he said, I am the God of, you know, your father Moses directly, Amram. But here it's your fathers in plural. Once again, we see the goodness of God. He wants the best for his people, just like what he did for Adam and Eve. He made and then gave them a garden of paradise to freely dwell in. Verse 18. And they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. God had a plan, and in it he will overcome man's shortcomings. Just ask Pharaoh to let you go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice. I'll do the rest. If you do the will of the Lord, his word will come to pass. Do not be afraid to walk with and for the true God. This walking does include failing, but get up and keep moving. After all, the time frame we live in is called the administration of grace. It's not the law administration where you get beaten down, you know, if you do something wrong. It's grace. Hey, it's grace. So get up and keep moving. Verses 19 to 21. And I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. 
And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. And the New Living Translation, verse 22, reads, Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. See, Easterners generally dress in simple garments, but when they attend a banquet or a wedding feast, they dress lavishly, trying to look their best at uh, these sacred festivals. They would adorn themselves with the best jewelry and clothing so as not to disgrace themselves or to be displeasing to the deities. You want to show up, you know, and the deity doesn't like what you got on. You can't wear a bowling shirt, you know. If your best wasn't very nice, it was permissible to borrow from a richer neighbor. Borrowing of clothes and jewelry was so common that people thought nothing of it and were not surprised to see some of their best garments loaned by members of their families to their neighbors. Oh, oh. Owing to the secrecy of their departure, the Hebrews would be unable to take away their own tangible property. They will tell Pharaoh that they're going out into the desert to sacrifice and celebrate a feast to their God and then return to Egypt. They could take their cattle, their gold, their silver, but all their possessions had to be left behind. So why not take advantage of this custom and solicit or claim from the Egyptians the wealth that had come into the land because of Joseph? Nice plan God has here, right? It's amazing how it always seems so simple on paper. Moses, you travel to Egypt. Gather the elders. Tell them God sent you. But you're going to lead them to the promised land of their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. Next, go to Pharaoh. Tell him you want to go sacrifice to your God in the desert, three-day journey. Good excuse for you to take all your animals with you because you don't know which animals your God wants sacrificed. Also, take every article of gold and silver that your neighbors have so as not to disappoint the God you're going to worship. Yeah, Pharaoh at first won't let you go, but eventually he will after I show him a thing or two about supernatural power. Sounds easy enough? 